Okay, I'd like to talk now about the stereochemistry of additions of Grignard's and organolithiums, things like that, to uh, carbonyl compounds. So, one point I'd like to mention first is with cyclohexanones. Cyclohexanones are pretty common in steroids and terpene chemistry, so they're quite important. Although the uh, carbonyl itself is sp2, it can form either an axial alcohol or an equatorial alcohol. If the group, incoming group, the R group, comes in equatorial, that will force the OH to go axial, and that's what's usually observed. And actually, I have a nice example from this year's um, Chem 342 research project because they're working with menthone, which is a cyclohexanone. And the, the axial position would be here, and the equatorial position would be here. Well, the the incoming R group goes there, so we get the axial alcohol. Next, I'd like to talk about Cram's rule, which deals with additions of uh, organolithiums, Grignard reagents, to chiral aldehydes and ketones, such as this one. This could be a hydrogen if it's an aldehyde. It could be an alkyl group as well. I'm assuming it's an achiral alkyl group for the purposes of this. So. What these refer to are small, medium, and large. And Cram's rule was developed just to explain some experimental results. It's not necessarily uh, based on a, a real solid theoretical foundation. But it works most of the time to explain the stereochemistry of the product because once the uh, incoming R group goes on here, we'll get a new chiral center, and clearly this chiral center is going to affect where that goes. So what Crown's rule says is that we want to put the largest group A 
180 degrees to the carbonyl. As, as you know, it's usually better to do um, Newman projections for this sort of thing. So. So we put the large group 180 degrees to the carbonyl, and we assume then that the incoming nucleophile Tracks the less hindered side. So the nucleophile in this case is sort of R minus, and so we'll have like coming in here. And if you then draw the product that you get as a result, you would get something like this. And we can redraw that so we can look at how this maps onto this and you can see the nucleophile just goes opposite the smaller group and the O minus ends up opposite the medium group. So an example of this reaction would be you take this aldehyde and you notice this matches these line up nicely with the uh, example here. So the large group is set 180 degrees to the oxygen of the carbonyl. So we would predict if we add a Grignard, this is done in ether, we would get the incoming uh, nucleophile, the phenyl, is going to line up with the small group. And in fact, 80% of the product is this diastereomer. Uh, the term used for describing this type of diastereomer, uh, this one is called a 3 -O. And the other diastereomer that's possible would be if the incoming group came in from the other side the side of the medium group, that would give us this.
and this does in fact make up 20% of the product. So Crown's rule doesn't tell you, you know, you'll get 100% of something, it simply indicates the preference for the stereochemistry, which is important if you're trying to do uh, the synthesis of a chiral natural product uh, using what's called asymmetric synthesis, where you try and use it, the um, existing and uh, antimerically pure centers, hopefully, to influence uh, when you make a new center, you want it, uh, it one way, you don't want to be creating mixtures all the way through your synthesis. Now, uh, there are uh, limitations to this. You can see the theoretical model for this may not look so good if this is a really bulky group. Why would the large group want to go um, sin to another large group, for example? And so, in fact, there's a newer model called the Falcon on model, which I'll come to in a bit. But for a lot of simple cases, Cram's rule does work. And for exams, you can certainly use it to predict products. I won't take points off if you're using Crown's rule uh, to predict your answers. But there's another situation that Cram discovered patterns, which is when you have a collating group uh, on the nearby carbon. A collating group is something that will bind to the metal in combination with the oxygen. Uh, so you have two atoms, probably oxygens in, in many cases, two atoms, and they will tend to hold the metal in place. And that's a different situation that will give, give us different results. 